you all, Farmer Jesse here. Over the next few weeks, we are going to be doing something a little bit different with this channel. Equally fun, equally awesome, but different. Essentially, what's happening is that earlier this year, we were awarded a grant from Southern Sayer. And our proposal included several things, but one of them was that we wanted to take the four primary principles of conservation agriculture, as outlined by the NRCS and the FAO and Nature, and break down their importance for market gardeners in addition to getting a little nerdy about how to execute them on a technical level with a little bit of emphasis on the South. This has pretty much been our goal from the beginning to take those four primary principles of conservation agriculture and provide some technical detail that we feel like has been missing. Of course, I also do a very detailed breakdown of these principles and how to utilize them in the garden in my book, The Living Soil Handbook. Links below for that. So if these principles resonate and you find yourself hungry for more, uh, that's another good way to keep on learning. Plus, uh, if you get it from notillgrowers.com, it's a great way to support our work. Anyway, there will be four videos generally covering each of the four principles and several additional videos like the one I recently put up on cover crops, um, giving more technical detail and specific practices, especially as they relate to soil health. Things are about to get real nerdy on this channel for the next little while, nerdier than usual. It's a bit of a lecture series, but like a cool one. So let's do it. <laughs> First things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. So the four basic principles of conservation agriculture are as follows. Keep the soil covered as much as possible. Keep it planted as much as possible. Disturb it as little as you possibly can. And diversity, 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 diverse, what? So I'm going to do a video for each of these principles, but the first video is going to center on keeping the soil covered absolutely as much as possible, including the whys, why is keeping the soil covered important, and also some of the hows and whats, if whats is a thing. First, the whys. We hear about mulching and covering the soil all the time with straw or hay or wood chips or compost or synthetic materials or whatever. And we will discuss these individually a little bit more in a minute, but why? Why is covering the soil so important? What does soil coverage with a mulch do for soil conservation and effectively soil health? Well, let's start with a little history. First, mulches are freaking ancient, like beginning of time ancient and widespread throughout the world. I mean, archeologists have found remnants of what is called lithic mulch agriculture. Um, that is mulching with essentially rock materials in sites from Israel to Rome to South America and elsewhere. This makes sense, right? As you can imagine that thousands of years ago, rocks were probably a lot easier to find than say, I don't know, fresh wood chips. And of course, other materials have long been employed as well, from the leaves of trees to the stalks of grasses. And though some of those materials have changed, or at least become, I don't know, more widely available, the reasons why farmers and gardeners throughout history have employed them has not really. You've probably heard of water, right? All life on Earth and probably trillions of other planets depend on it to some extent. Plants not excluded. Because plants utilize water in a number of different ways. Water helps transport nutrients into the plant cells and leaves and stems. Water assists in the enzymatic uh, activities required for microbes to fetch nutrients from the soil. Water is essential for photosynthesis synthesis, right? We literally get the oxygen we breathe from plants splitting water molecules with photons from the sun, which in my opinion just does not get enough credit for how badass that is. And keeping the soil covered with some sort of mulch effectively keeps water around the plants in the soil for you to utilize. You see, bare soil has somewhat of a wicking effect on the soil and allows water to escape into the atmosphere. Mulch helps to protect the soil from that wicking effect, from exposure to the wind and sunlight and the depleted of its moisture. Also, mulches just keep the soil in place and from being compacted from things like heavy rainfall events, uh, especially the ones we get here in the southern US, and heavy machinery and long durations of concentrated livestock, compaction being a global issue, according to the NRCS and many others. And so too is erosion in a very big way from rain and wind. It's been reported that up to one third of the world's arable lands have been lost since 1950, which losing a third of the world's growing medium is, in case it's not totally clear, not so great because with it goes giant caches of carbon that are currently helping to destabilize our planet's atmosphere um, and climate in general, no big deal. Well, keeping the soil covered helps to not add to that soil carbon loss. Mulches can provide yield benefits when used correctly. And I say used correctly because not every mulch is inherently right for every context. 
Uh, for instance, if you're in a cool climate, and you may not want a lightly colored mulch, at least not early in the season. Whereas you may absolutely want a light colored mulch in, I don't know, hotter climates um, like the South, especially during the heat of the summer. So for instance, if you live in Canada and you put down straw mulch over potatoes early in the spring, and some of them rot and some of them take, I don't know, half the season to pop out of the soil, that may not be an instance where the yield improvements that we often see from mulching are actually realized. But I digress a little bit here. Some other quick notes about the benefits. Uh, mulches have been shown to increase soil organic matter. Uh, in some situations, they can provide plant nutrients because as they are decomposed from biological decomposers, uh, the nutrients they contain are released in a plant available form. Mulches also look cool. What? That's factual. And so all of that together, you can see why this idea is included in conservation agriculture, because few things can serve and even improve the soil as much as mulch. Some quick downsides to mulch. I think this is important. Using the wrong mulch can negatively affect your yields, as I mentioned a second ago in Canada hypothetical Canada. And it's not just having the soil be too cool, but if you are using something like compost as your mulch, you may also have issues with the soil getting too warm. We often struggle on our farm with carrot germination in the summer, not because they won't germinate necessarily, but because when they come through that compost, the surface of the compost is so hot the seedlings burn up. It's kind of annoying. So in that specific situation, a really, really light amount of light colored mulch actually helps a lot. Mulches can contain herbicide residues, continuing with our negatives. Straw, hay, and even compost can be laden with broadleaf herbicides um, that will kill broadleaf plants like tomatoes, potatoes, etc. Weeds can all be an issue with practically any mulch material, including straw. I once covered uh, strawberries in straw that contained wheat seed. It was not pretty. Actually, it was kind of pretty because wheat is a really cool plant and it grows all winter, but it was not good for the strawberries to have that competition. Uh, mulches can be heavy to move around. Mulches can be hard to find. Mulches, especially those with a lot of surface area like sawdust, remember the smaller a cover material is, the more surface area it actually has. Um, they may contain, uh, you know, they may take up nitrogen at the surface level, which is not great for shallow rooters. Uh, and mulches up against the plant can cause rot issues like fungal issues. Certain bugs like pill bugs or slugs may also enjoy your mulches and then your plant. Again, I do literally dedicate an entire chapter to mulch materials in the Living Soil Handbook uh, because it takes a book to really get into the nitty gritty details. Uh, but let me give you a brief rundown of the mulch materials and effectively how to use them. So let's talk straw. Straw is an excellent resource as it is almost solely carbon. Before you employ straw as your mulch, just check for weed or wheat seeds. Know that the light color will cool the soil, so only use it where you want cooler soil. Same kind of goes for hay. Um, there's no avoiding the weed seeds in hay if, unless you cut it yourself. Once you start with hay, you pretty much just have to keep going with hay, layering it over and over every six months or so. Hay is also a soil cooler. I don't know if that makes sense. A, a light, like straw, it makes the soil cooler or it keeps it cool. Then you have compost. Note that the dark color also serves to warm the soil, which can be great, like I said. But I should warn you that in the summer, that warmth, that specific warmth, can create issues in warmer climates like here in the southern US. Uh, so sometimes using a lightly colored mulch over top of your dark mulches can be helpful. You also have mulches like cardboard and mulch or craft papers, which are not generally used on their own. They're usually coupled with other mulches like compost. Otherwise, those just they just blow away. Um, but I do like this combination. Uh, cardboard is inexcusably wasted in our country. Uh, it's an amazing carbon source. So where you can employ it, I generally say you should. So long as, of course, it has not been waxed or dyed or, or sprayed with fungicides. Then you have plastic mulches like polyethylene and landscape fabric. I am not a personally a huge fan of plastics as more and more research is revealing the dangers of microplastics on soil biota and human health. I mean, they're literally finding it in placentas, but I also respect the utility of blocking weeds and warming the soil that plastic has and holding in moisture. Um, and to be clear, we do still use large plastic silage tarps on our farm occasionally, though we are always looking for ways to reduce our dependence on them. Anyway, leaves and leaf mold are another amazing one. If you have access to leaves, these can be rich with nutrients and excellent for gardens. Grass clippings from the early spring make both an excellent mulch and a nutritious soil amendment. Just get them from a yard that is not sprayed and that does not have a lot of grasses going to seed yet, hence early spring. Uh, wood chips are another common mulch, but should be used with a nitrogenous material like 
compost to avoid nitrogen tie up. There are bark mulches, which are great if they are not dyed, D-Y-E-D, uh, but use them similar to wood chips. Sawdust is a, better in, is a better one in the pathways than on the bed surfaces or around plants. It can make a mess and it can tie up nitrogen. Um, and it can also be somewhat hydrophobic, deflecting the water off of its surface. Also, how have I not mentioned cover crops yet? Cover crops are great as a mulch because they require very little handling. I described some of the, the ways to use cover crops as a mulch in the cover crop video I just put up last week. But essentially, you are growing a tall cover crop like winter rye and smashing it down in the late spring, and that will serve as a nice mulch for much of the summer. Um, or you can use summer cover crops like sorghum sudan grass to do that same sort of mulching effect for the winter. Uh, the bonus here is that you get living plant roots that hold the soil together and in place uh, and produce soil organic matter, and you get the above ground biomass that we call mulch. Um, double win. Also, I know that I started this out talking a bit about lithic materials, rocks, but I'm not going to recommend those here on any sort of scale. Uh, they're heavy, and so many other wasted carbonaceous materials that are already available for free or cheap um, are probably a little bit easier for you to move around and easier for you to clean up if you decide to change your practices. Not saying there is no use for lithic materials, just, you know, proceed with caution. And also probably keep a chiropractor close. Just saying. As for application of mulches, there is no one-size-fits-all uh, approach. How much you apply and when will depend entirely on your context. But always remember, there is such thing as too much of a good thing. Your compost, is, if your compost is really mulchy and you add too thick of a layer, seeds may not germinate because the top layer struggles to hold moisture. Simply study the mulch you have access to and use it smartly, if that's a word. Anyway, I think that's going to conclude this first in this series. Let me know your thoughts and questions and preferred mulch materials in the comments. Um, we will be continuing this series for the next few weeks, so buckle up or just subscribe to the channel so it pops in your feed. Anyway, big thanks to Southern Sayer for support. Also, speaking of support, thank you to all of our supporters at patreon.com slash no-till growers and to everyone who has purchased the Living Soil Handbook from no-tillgrowers.com. Much appreciated. Love seeing the photos. Like this video if you like this video. Share your thoughts and comments below. Other than that, you all, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.